All right, for you it's been no time, for me it's been a couple of hours, um, so let, let me try this again. Um, so where we are is we've just found the, um, the image charge and its location. So it's right here, um, somewhere inside the circle, or inside the sphere, excuse me. Um, outside the sphere we have this charge Q at, at this location here, distance D outside of the um, sphere, which has radius R. And again, the sphere has a radius r, so x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared. And that's going to be very, very important when we switch to um, spherical coordinates in a, in a very short time, actually. We're, we're just about ready to do that. Um, first thing, though, is I think we'll just write the fields. So um, in this case, we have a situation where we can just use Coulomb's law, right? So we have two point charges, um, one real and one imaginary, and so we can just go ahead and write the real, the real field, right? The field from the um, from the real charge, uh, and it's not very difficult. We have to do it somewhere here along, somewhere here on the. Um, on the sphere, on the surface of the sphere, anywhere along here is fine. But that has an x component, that has a y component, has an x component here, it has a y component here, and so forth and so on. And we're actually drawing the vector like this, from here to here, right, for Coulomb's law. Here's our source, here's our field point, right here at the, um, at the surface of the sphere. So it's going to be, um, this position x, y, z minus uh, this position, the position of our real charge, our source charge. Okay, so um, this minus that. So uh, we're going to have, this is an inverse square law, um, but it has that direction, um, which is, means we're going to have basically r over um, r cubed, because this is equal to r hat over r squared. Right, so um, let's just go ahead and write that. It's not particularly difficult for the x and y components. There is absolutely nothing in the uh, there's no, absolutely nothing in the source, so we don't have to worry about that. And then for the z components, just z minus d plus r, okay, um, in the z hat direction. And then uh, we just go through and we um, sum the squares of those things on the inside, and we'll have our um, and we'll have our field. That's our field for the real charge. And for our image, our image charge has just the same thing, only it's coming from this point down here, which is a little bit lower. Um, well. And so it can be pointing. It can point this way. Uh, if we have something down here, it can be pointing that way. It has um, a this one's going to point every every direction all the time. So that's minus Q O times R over R plus D over four pi epsilon naught. So charge over four pi epsilon naught and then all of our fun um, vectors, x, y, and um, z, which is now using this r squared over r, r plus d. So r squared over r plus d squared. No, no square. I'll have the square in a second. I need that in the z hat direction. That's why I've got those. Okay, so we have x squared plus y squared plus z minus r squared over r plus d squared to the three halves. Okay, so those are our um, two fields. Uh, it'll be easier um, to go to to transform to transform to another coordinate system. Spherical coordinates is what I recommend. All right. Um, because what we're going to do is we're going to find the um, field only along, only around here. Now, why does spherical coordinates help? Well, I mean, if we look at 
what we have to do to translate, we say x is going to be equal to r sine theta cosine phi, y is equal to r um, sine theta sine phi, and z is equal to r cosine theta. So this is all stuff that you've been doing for years. Um, now we automatic since r is a constant automatically we know that we've cut down the number of variables we need to worry about after we do the transformation to two that's good i mean the fewer the variables the fewer chances we have to make mistakes at least after the transformation on top of that um, our symmetry here around around this axis it doesn't really matter where we are there's there's no um, difference when we do uh, when we do a rotation our symmetry tells us Actually, this, um, these uh, cosine phi's and sine phi's are going to drop out. We're only going to have one variable left when when we decide that we want to um, when we actually write our charge distribution, and it's only going to have to do with theta. So we're going to be um, sitting pretty at that point. So so one variable is much better than three. Uh, this is a really good um, this is a really good uh, transformation to make. So uh, let's go ahead and make that transformation. Um, the first thing to do is just add up x plus y plus z. If we add up x plus y plus z in the respective directions, I uh, hope you remember this, the x hat, y hat plus z hat, or z times z hat, x, x hat do, 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 equals little r, r hat, right? So when we, if we just add this plus this plus um, this times that, we're going to get um, our little r times r hat, and that's going to be pretty nice. We're going to like that a whole lot. Uh, nice and simple to work with. Um, uh, now, actually, little r in this case is always going to be big R because we're stuck at the um, edge here. So this is the general general coordinate transformation, but we're stuck here. Little r is always going to be equal to big R in our case. We've made that radial variable a constant, so, so that makes it even nicer. We've just got a constant in the radial direction there from these three um, terms. This guy, however, we have to subtract this guy. We have d plus r. Uh, that's going to make us multiply, and we're going to have to multiply out this z hat. Now, this z hat um, changes direction. Right, so z hat is when theta is zero, z hat is in the radial direction. When theta is 90 degrees, um, z hat is in the theta direction. It's in it's pointing this way. So this is our theta direction along the tangent to the sphere, right? So um, this is cosine theta r hat minus sine theta theta hat. All right doesn't look very pretty. And again, when we're right here, theta is increasing this way, right? It's increasing as we go like go like this. When we turn clockwise, theta is increasing. So um, actually, it doesn't matter how we go around. It doesn't matter what direction we're looking at. But we go down this way, theta is increasing. So theta hat is pointing downwards. So we've got a minus sign. Everything's pretty cool, right? So um, that's what we have to write here, cosine theta r hat minus sine theta um, theta hat. And um, if you're really, really clever, then you've already seen what this is going to mean in the um, long run. But, uh, you know, it's going, to, it's going to take a little while for us to actually, um, actually get rid of all that. All right, so then we um, square all these things. We've got x squared plus y squared. If we multiply this out, we have z squared plus, or this one here, z squared plus d plus r squared minus the difference. But we have x squared plus y squared plus z squared. I said x squared plus y squared plus z squared is just r. And I said we had this d plus r squared is in there. And then we have the combination here. We have the, the two um, d plus r times z, and z is r cosine theta. All right, and so that's our three halves. And if you've done a lot of this vector, vector calculus, then you already know, know all about that. Um, this happens all the time, that, that particular um, 
that particular change there. And then we go and do something for our image as well. And our image, we do the same thing. Um, now we have to uh, play around a little bit. Um, let's see, we have R over R plus D, right? Um, we have all sorts of similar things going on up here. We have R, R hat minus, um, R squared over D plus R, right? All multiplied by this funky factor, cosine theta R hat minus sine theta theta hat. So everything's running pretty cool. We've got um, our R squared still comes out. Then we have um, uh, R to the fourth over um, D plus R or R plus D squared plus now we have or now we have minus so that conforms to this guy only with with this R squared over um, R plus D and we have minus two we have three R's and we have an R plus D down here and then we have to multiply that all by cosine theta to the three halves and um, things are looking good. Except this is really ugly, right? This is really, really, really ugly. Um, so that means we probably better start pulling things out and trying to work with them and make things uh, a little bit easier. So we'll just go ahead and simplify. We'll simplify this E2 here. Then we'll add things later. Um, so if we do our simplification, we have our minus 4 pi epsilon naught here. We have our r over r plus d. Right? Um, actually, I want to get rid of an r over r plus d here. right? So I can pull r over r plus d out. Then I have a d plus r left over here. right? So we can just go ahead and square that. That'll be good. Um, and that means uh, in this numerator we have uh, r plus d in the r hat direction, right? Minus r times, uh, I guess I've called it the funky factor. And so um, if you need a little funk, here's some funk in your numerator, all right? So now we've done, we've done all this in the um, numerator, making that nice. We should do the same thing with the denominator, right? Um, so we have a common factor of r squared here, and we have this um, nasty d plus r here. So we can pull that out. So we have a r squared, r over d plus r squared to the three halves, which means we have uh, d plus r over r cubed when it comes out. So it's actually just the opposite of this other bit here. So we have r plus d over r cubed. That's actually going to mean we have one factor of this, and no factors of that, because they cancel, right? And then we were left with a denominator of um, uh, d plus r squared plus r squared minus 2 d plus r r cosine theta to the 3 halves. Isn't that nice? We have we have now after cleaning that up a little bit. At least we have um, common denominators, right? So that's looking really nice. I think we can all be um, pleasantly surprised about that, right? So now we just want to um, now we want to add those two fields up, right? Uh, how much room do I have? Uh, I've got. A reasonable amount of room so why don't I just yeah why don't I just go ahead and cancel these things out here because um, I think I'll have enough room on this piece of paper to uh, actually get done with all this stuff so if I have enough room then I may as well go ahead and show this step because it was somewhere around here um, before I took my nap 
that I was getting all confused because there are far too many things going on um, to do this while you're tired so always make sure you get a good night's sleep and if not know when it's a good time to take a nap all right so now we have to add them up um, I guess that wasn't something I wrote before I think I assumed that when I did my first run through I just got these and then I added them up and then I started doing the transformations and stuff like that but I don't think that's the best way to be honest so uh, let's go ahead and write that field down um, we've got Q over 4 pi epsilon naught um, and let's just assume everybody's got this factor right we just keep that factor out r plus d over r so that means when i um we all also all have this factor of r squared plus d plus r squared minus 2d plus r times r times cosine theta to the three halves um so anyway since i've put this guy brought this guy out that means i have to multiply everything in here by r over d plus r right so i've got um r over d plus r times um r so we have r squared over um d plus r right and then i'm adding minus this so i have minus d plus r in the r hat direction and then i say okay i've got my um minus um d plus r times r over d plus r which is just r minus a minus which is a plus r oh that's nice that's going to cancel and give me a nice zero so i guess i don't really have to write the funky factor and all the funk well we lose the funk we lost the funk I hope I hope you didn't grow too attached to the funk. Okay, so now with all that, w w now that we've gotten rid of the funk, um, I guess I've got a line that I can simplify. Right, so we have q over four pi epsilon naught. Um, this guy is not the prettiest thing on earth, but um, if we do a little bit of math we get um, minus d over r times a little bit extra and I'll write that little bit extra in just a second times our denominator uh, which is r squared plus d plus r squared minus 2r d plus r cosine theta to the three halves right and um, that little extra we had was a d minus 2r, okay? So we, so that's going to tell us something. And this is all in our r hat direction, so everything's radial, which is good. We wanted everything to be radial, radial um, because if this the potential is uniform here, then all the field lines have to go directly out right at the um, edge here. So the field being radial is exactly what we wanted at the edge of this sphere so the, you know the only thing we have to do now is to go ahead and use gauss's law and i'm going to i've got less than a minute left so i'm going to rest my hand and um then i'll go and finish this up for us all right okay so now i know you all really love all of this um all of this algebra right because i mean algebra is what you sign up sign up for when you say i want to be be a physics major you say hey what i really want to do is watch somebody else do algebra you know three hours a day three days a week right and i'm willing to pay ten thousand dollars a semester to do that right um and and hey i mean that is really cool so i mean i don't want to get get your hopes up though right um there's not really much left for this problem uh now we want to use um gauss's law right um so we want to use gauss's law to uh, to get the um charge distribution 
and you're saying, ah, Gauss's Law, I remember Gauss's Law. Gauss's Law looks like, um, well, what's one way that we wrote it? We wrote it as uh, the enclosed charge is equal to epsilon naught times phi e, right? So that's some big nasty integral here, some big nasty integral there, and stuff like that. But this is when we're going from having uh, some sort of charge distribution to some sort of field, right? So we don't have to worry about that. We'll use the other form of Gauss's Law. We'll use the differential form of Gauss's Law. We have rho is equal to epsilon naught times del dot e. Uh, the only problem is, is that in here we have, um, we have something that has no divergence, right? Um, so that's no good. And two, we just found, we only really found the field here right at the um, edge, right? And you know, that's not really what we want. In fact, we also know that this uh, this field has no divergence except for right here and right here, which means it only really has a divergence here because it's fake inside of here. Uh, the, field, the field is zero in here because the, the potential on the inside is uniform. Um, so we have to use that trick that I showed you in class uh, several times, actually. Uh, now, it's not really a trick. I can, you know, we can derive it and all sorts of other fun things. But instead, we want to use sigma. So instead of rho, we get sigma. Now, the problem is, is that we're getting the surface charge distribution by um, taking the derivative at a um, point where the field is uh, discontinuous. Well, you can't take the derivative where the field is discontinuous unless unless we use the um, step functions that we were using it earlier. If we use the heavy side function, we can do it. Um, but if we do use the heavy side function, we just get a nice, simple relationship here, which is the change in the field times the normal the normal direction from uh, of the surface uh, times epsilon naught again gives us sigma. So that's all right. Um, and it gets a little bit easier, okay? So the normal direction from this surface, right? We already know that. That's always going to be r hat. And this is always in r hat direction. That's actually looking pretty good. And we, we know it's, the field is zero in here. So we only really need to know what the um, field is right here at the surface. So it's just e. Delta e becomes e because one of those e's is zero. And so that's all we have to do is we have to take the dot product of this thing with r, and this is, the only direction here is r, and um, r hat dot r hat is just one. So really, we're we've been done, and I didn't tell you tell you about it. I just you know I really really wanted wanted you to get really excited about what was coming, right? So here we here we go. All right. Um, we'll just finish this off really quickly. We have a sigma is equal to um, minus um, q over 4 pi because we take this epsilon naught and cancel that epsilon naught. Um, some d over r factor here. Our fun r squared plus d plus r squared minus 2r d plus r cosine theta to the 3 halves all over d minus 2r. And that's it. That's all. That's it. That's all we really needed. And you know, this weekend I've written four lectures. And um, I prepared three of these problems, and I've already performed two of them. And I think that you know, getting such a cool-looking thing here, where we have just um, just this uh, this factor to worry about, I think that really really means that I should um, get to take a break. So I think I'm going to watch uh, Rashomon, and um, I wish I could get a Rashomon-esque um, physics problem for you, but uh, I think. I think that would, um, yeah, I think I can think of one, actually. Uh, I don't know if I can think of one for this class. Actually, I can. I mean, we were just talking about Gauss's Law and stuff like that. There were plenty of them in the first, um, in the first unit. Um, so anyways, I think I'm going to go watch a movie. I'm going to watch a classic movie that you should watch. And if you haven't watched it, you maybe, um, ought to consider it. Uh, but we've got a really nice answer here. It's 
it's got something um it's got some graph that look yeah let's not worry about the graph um so it's really nice you've got something that's minimal or maximal see this term is minimal here so it's minus a bunch of stuff so it's the smallest it can be right here so there's a there's a lot of charge here right which is what you'd expect and not so much down here it goes down um so this sphere um this sphere ends up having an induced charge on it a total induced charge in fact um so i mean it's just looking really really nice so uh, i don't know what to do i, I think i'll keep on babbling you think you think that's a good idea? I don't think that's a good idea. I think that you should just take this and you should look at some of your homework problems because you get to do some other fun things with spheres in your homework problems, especially the Part B ones. There's some pretty good things to do with spheres in Part B, especially this hemispherical asperity problem. I love that problem. Um, but this is great, and I'll see you in class.